One day I went to a football match with some school chums and the National Front was standing outside the f- football ground selling newspapers. Mm. And I thought, oh, it was just meant to be. And I was 15, 14, 15. I thought, this is just meant to be. So I didn't go into the match. I stayed talking to these uh, incredibly strange, yeah. to be honest. Uh, they felt strange then. They're definitely strange by today's standards. And there were just four men stood there and they spoke to me for hours. We just stood we just stood outside. I think we went to a pub and had a pint. They bought me a pint. Which is the recruitment process? I really. think I, I I think I think so. And um, we spoke yeah, we spoke for a couple of hours about what I believed and what about them. And the, and they they answered the questions really really dour but quite serious people, you know. And yeah. I think I wrote in the first book. You know, if you didn't know what the books were, you'd think they were well read. But these these people could explain everything. So what about me? What about school? What about work? And they, and they just say, "Listen, son, you're going to get nothing until we've deported all the black people." Right. So it's it's again the the way that radicalization takes a hold because they've put so much effort. The radicalizer has so put normal. so much effort into it. Yeah. But the person trying to fight it hasn't. I mean, it's it's just it's just, it's just normal. Think fancy, it wouldn't be necessary. Fancy going to a pub. Fancy going to a pub having a pint and yeah. just having a conversation with each other. And I. I, I no, I can't remember any time previously to that male adult sitting down and just talking to me, right? About the way that the world works, and here they were, and they were so obviously they weren't, but to me, they were so knowledgeable about stuff. I see. They knew everything. They had a car. Yeah. They had a girlfriend. They this had is jobs. This yep. is this is the, what I, to, to describe it then is ordinary and extraordinary at the same time yep. what what you did was extraordinary even by the standards of the time even yep. your your racist mates at school were saying you've gone too you've far gone too so far. it was extraordinary yep. you make it sound so ordinary but it is which is why you're good at what you do now i think so because I'm never sure. i it's don't not like ju- we're looking yeah. at we're not looking at a rare specimen under a microscope no. we're looking at something that could happen in the right circumstances just walk, to anybody yeah, just walked up to four blokes selling a newspaper and I said, I've really been desperately trying to join your organisation. And they said, do you want to come for a pint? And bang. That and you're it. 15 now. Yep. Many of us don't grow up in environments where we're even aware of, of the idea of not liking someone because of where they come from. It yeah. seems that you did grow up in an environment where, whether you realise it or not, that was. Well, I think I only met my grandfather three times. Right. And my mother had a very poor opinion of him. Yes. Uh, very poor opinion of my father too and and so we, we were just you know that part of the family the Irish part of the family um, wasn't alien to us but we were distant from it okay um, we, we, we were distant for it and I think uh, partly then in my search for identity or my search for for belonging was the the absenteeism of, of, of the absence of a father and then looking for male role model you know yeah. the strong man in your life who leads by examples and can you know change light bulbs all that yeah. kind of stuff which is very important according to my missus very important yeah. a man can change a light bulb um led me led me on that on that sort of adventure where where can i find strong men okay. where, where can i find men that will open uh, kick doors in as yes. it happened in the national front where where can i find where can i find those those sort of people and one of the one of the attractions to the National Front in the 1980s was you grew up under the spectre of it. Every wall had mm. NF on it. I mm. went to school in, in Greenwich in, in, in Kidbrook in South East London. Every wall had NF on it. And you, you grew up knowing what the National Front was. People would talk about the National Front. I'm National Front. They would identify as National Front. It was more than a, a tiny little political party. Mm. It was an it was just an ideology. I'm NF. And I I saw that. I saw, I saw that it was... Um, I guess the same way people are attracted to flashy trainers mm. or particular brands of clothing. I saw th- this thing on the wall, and I, I knew straight away this was su- this organisation. Wrongly, of course, yeah. I believe that this organisation, this dangerous organisation, would somehow ele- would somehow elevate me. I would I would leave poverty and and sadness and what my shrink calls a deep. I have a deep sadness in my life. Right. Yeah, this deep sadness, and I would. Um, you know, I'd be something special, and I would be better than everybody else. Every because youngest of four brothers, right? You, you, you back of the queue. You were always back of the queue. I had, by the time I got a jumper, it had been worn to about fifteen village fates yeah. already. You know, but um, so I, 
perfectly happy childhood, but I, I would. But there's something underpinning it. And I, yeah, I, I, and I was a misery, and my brothers didn't go looking or, or searching for those things. How interesting. And also, this is before toxic masculinity was even a phrase, and yet you've already conflated the far right with this warped notion of what it means to be a man. And, and let me tell you about toxic masculinity. I mean, in my house, the person who did everything, cooked, cleaned, she could uh, lay tile, she'd laid carpet, she decorated, she hung wallpaper, was my mother. Wow. She was, she was the, not masculine, because she's a very feminine, beautiful woman, oh, cool. but my mother showed us all as kids women can do anything and then we saw yeah, and we saw it in in her life in her life later on she was made redundant at 58 because she was the woman in the company mm. you know women don't need to get the full pension mm. all that kind of all that kind of stuff right. so yeah the the search for masculinity and of course i found the toxic masculinity but also i was also very very conscious and very very aware women can do anything uh and men ignore that at your peril mm or fight uh, to your detriment so there's no simple so sort of and it's interesting you mentioned there's nothing listen the, the, there's nothing text but people always want to say this you know, yeah did someone come along and exactly twist this. your mind yeah, i'm so glad I, you've picked up on that and already. this is one of the things people say about extremists and it's yeah. like and one of the things i say now can you tell me why well i know the answers well i'm sure you know the answer why but can you tell me why someone why living in poverty feeling that they've been robbed or, or let down why shouldn't they be racist what, what answers yeah. have, what answers have you got to it that's the that's the battle of anti-racism is to not just plug those gaps but to drag people up into what and also build a civil yeah. and civilized society and so people like this narrative that little johnny was just sitting at home one day watching the teletubbies and suddenly a nazi appears on television and changes his life I, it, it just doesn't always work like no. that but for me i went look i've i looked for and i found the answer i found the wrong answer how old are we now um i think probably when i was about 12 or so 13 pretty young yeah. for, for, I mean, and, don't, of... and yeah and don't forget this is before the internet i have to keep stating this yes um i just i drew those conclusions